Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come into these moments where we open up your word, I pray that you would remove anything that would distract today from you speaking into our hearts and minds to transform us into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Today we conclude a sermon series that is called Even Though I Will, that we started several weeks ago. Pastor John launched us into it. And our goal and our prayer for this series has been that we would all grow as believers in, and as a congregation in a, a defiant faith that says, no matter what I face in this life, even though I will, even though I'm in pain, yet will I worship. Even though I may die, I will not fear. Even though things look hopeless, I will trust. And today, I want us to look at a message that I've called, Even Though I Have Fallen, I Will Rise. As we spend the next few moments diving into the Word of God and looking at the subject of temptation. You see, the Bible says that every single one of us has, has sinned, so we've fallen into temptation. And so this is an important topic for us to look at as we go into a new year and we face new challenges ahead of us. I believe that there's some people in this congregation that are struggling right now, that you've been tangled up in a sin or some, some problem that's got you tripped up and trapped, and you feel like there's no way out. And Jesus has come today, and he says, I have come to bring you life and to bring you freedom. He says, not only did I go to the cross to, to pay for your sins, to bring you forgiveness of sins, I have come to bring you freedom from those things that have bound you up, the shackles that have held you and to give you power over the temptations that have, have gripped you. Even though you have fallen, yet shall you rise. But here's the problem today that many of us face is that, that the voice of the enemy echoes in our minds oftentimes when he says, well, well, look at you. You're a failure. You'll never rise. You'll never get untangled. You'll never be able to escape that. And so as we dive into this, I would like to invite you through the next few moments to, to listen to this message through the lens of this. Uh, think about the, the top one or two things, uh, temptations that, that you struggle with the most and listen to it. You might want to jot it down there like privately so no one can, can see it. But if, if I want you to listen to it this morning. And maybe that thing is for you that's it's anger that you think, man, I have such a short fuse and people just push my buttons and I, I just lose it and I don't want to. Or maybe your thing is criticism. Maybe you just find yourself critical all the time and you've taken criticism to like the level of a spiritual gift. Like you walk in this morning already at St. John, you found five things you don't like about the place. And you're like, oh, I, gotta, I, I just don't want to do this all the time. Maybe it's, it's a problem with the things you look at. Like you struggle with your eyes. You say, Lord, I need help here. This is my thing. Whatever that is, take a moment to jot it down. And, and maybe you're here today and you're saying, man, you know what? I'm glad old so-and-so is here to hear this message. I don't deal with any of this stuff. Now, if that's you saying that, I want you to take a pencil and write pride right there on your bulletin with a capital P. Because every one of us is struggling with something. Maybe you've heard this old quote before. It goes something like this. It says, opportunity may knock only once, but temptation leans on the doorbell. Have you experienced that before? It's like, oh, every day I'm bombarded. We live in a culture, man, where we're bombarded with the temptations. And, and, and we have access to more and more things that can trip us up than ever before. Maybe you've thought before in your life, you know what, I'm going to head off down this pathway, this road over here into this thing, and, and I'll be able to manage it. But pretty soon, it becomes where it's managing you, and you've lost all control, and you begin to, to echo in your mind, you know, there was things that I, I said I would never do, there was places that I said I would never go, or decisions I would never make, but you found yourself making those, and you've fallen. Well, the good news is today, you don't have to stay down. There's hope, and there's victory, and there's a new day dawning. And even though you have fallen, you can rise. I want you to listen to the key verse today. For this message, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Isn't that a great verse? That might be one you want to start off the new year memorizing right there. This can help you through this year that 
that it's common to mankind, temptation. So to be human is to be tempted. But check this out, that even when we are faithless, it says that God is faithful as we dive in. Let's take a quick look at a definition of what temptation is. It looks like this. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. Satisfaction at the, the cost of obedience to God. And we're going to look at four things from the Word of God about temptation. Some of this might be, if you're a believer and you've grown up in the church, just a review. But for some of you, this may be some brand new insight that God wants to teach you this morning. To give you the confidence to, to head into a new year as you face the things that are going to be coming at you. And the first truth that we can learn today is this, that it's not a sin to be tempted. Listen to what the book of Hebrews says. It says, For we do not have a high priest in Jesus who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so the Bible says that even Jesus himself, and as we heard in our Matthew reading just a few minutes ago, that Jesus was led out into the desert to be tempted, that he has faced every temptation but not fallen. And somebody says, what, so Jesus was tempted to, to take something that didn't belong to him? I don't know, but it says he was tempted in every way. And so Jesus was tempted to cast his eyes and look at things that he shouldn't? I don't know, but it says that he was tempted in every way that we are. You mean Jesus, he was tempted to, to get angry and let his words cut because he, he had the power to cut? No, he, he got angry at the temple, but he didn't sin. You see the difference? He was led out into the desert to be tempted. Why? It was on purpose so that he could confront the devil and he could demonstrate his power and he could fulfill the law perfectly that we couldn't keep by not falling into sin. And then Jesus, he says, I'm able to empathize with you. I'm able to empathize with you in your temptation. See, Jesus understands that the strategy of the devil in temptation has always been this. It's been to, to challenge your confidence and my confidence in our Heavenly Father. To challenge our confidence in his ability to meet our needs legitimately. Think about it. We have needs in our lives that he, God has built into us. Let's say, like, take hunger for an example. You know, we've got to eat, but then there's some people that, man, they really struggle with it. And they, they just go way too far, and they eat things that aren't great for them. And they just have, a, oh, man, this is a struggle for me. There's other people who, that they, they struggle with, with other things in their lives where they, they, they have urges that are for intimacy in their life, but God has put boundaries around that in our lives. But Satan comes along and wants to distort something that God has built into us for good and to cause us to step outside of those boundaries into sin. You know, he's built into us a desire to better ourselves and, and for ambition. But ambition can go astray and get distorted when we say, you know what, I'm going to better myself at the cost of tearing you down. You see, we face these, these challenges and so the devil wants us to find satisfaction in our lives at the cost of obedience to God. The second thing that we're going to find out today about temptation is that you are never above temptation. Listen to what Paul says in verse 12. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Be careful, he says. This is the, the problem here in our lives is that many times we get overconfident thinking, man, I can handle this. And I walk into a situation and I'm thinking, man, I got this. Or I think this isn't my problem. It's somebody else. I can't wait to get the DVD of this sermon and send it to them because they need it. But I don't. And so we get overconfident. Have you ever been out driving on the highway here recently? They put those little warning strip things on the side where the yellow line is, and you're driving, and if you veer, you go, whoa, and it's like it makes you get back in here. Maybe I'm texting, and I go, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. The Holy Spirit is like these strips in our mind. We begin to veer towards sin, and our conscience, he speaks, and he's like, warning sign, be careful that you don't veer. Don't get overconfident in your ability to stand firm. It was... 1961. Arnold Palmer was playing in the Masters Tournament out in Augusta. It was a great tournament, and it was the final day of the tournament, Sunday. Arnold Palmer found himself in the final group. He was one stroke ahead, heading into the last hole of the tournament. He just needed to shoot a par four, and he would come home with the championship. He stepped up to the 18th, man. He like, 
feel in the groove, beautiful tee shot. It's down in the fairway, and he was walking to his second shot. And he recounted this story later. He was going toward his ball, and he looked over on the ropes. One of his friends was like, Arnold, come here. Arnold, come over here. And he, he broke his concentration. He's like, oh, and he goes over, and the guy's like, congratulations, man. Green jacket, the trophy, it's almost yours. And he said, at that moment, I began to think about what it would feel like to slide that coat on and, and all the accolades I was going to get. And he goes, I broke my concentration. I wasn't even thinking. I got up to my second shot. I'm thinking about that. And I just flared the shot off, and it landed in the green side bunker. He's like, okay, I got this. I can do this. There he is in the bunker. This is the actual shot there. He's, he does a shot out of the bunker. It flies the green and goes off to the other side. And now to four, he was going to have to put this ball now in the hole. Well, he, he puts it, and it goes past the hole. And now he has to put another putt back just to tie it up to go to a playoff. And he missed that one, and he scored a six on this hole. And he ends up losing the Masters when it was that close. He said, I got overconfident. I took my eye off of what I was supposed to be concentrating on. Jesus says today, you were never above temptation. Be careful that you don't fall. Next thing is this. God will never tempt you. Some people say, hey, Jet, God's tempting me. I say, no, God might test you, but he's not tempting you. I was like, why would, like, he put me in a room alone with all of the money from the raffle from my kids' class, and I had it all there, and I'm counting it by myself, and, and it was so, and I just, I, I'm the, I've been putting in so much work for this, and I'm the class mom, and, and I just wanted to treat myself to something, and I just felt that, and God was tempting me, and it says, and, and no, listen to what the Bible says in James chapter 1, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. What's the origin of temptation? He says, it's our own desires. Fueled by three things that the Bible says, the devil, the world, and our flesh. And the world is not just the planet Earth. It's our culture that we live in. That the society is tempting us into our evil desires. God doesn't tempt, but he might test you. Think back to the Old Testament when he tested Abraham. He said, I want you to take your son up on the mountain and sacrifice him to me. Why would God ask him to do that? It wasn't to tempt him into sin, but it was to test his trust, to test his faith, to, to put Abraham through the crucible of, of faith, to purify his trust and confidence. And maybe God has you in a situation like that today, that you're saying, I don't know why I'm here. But God is per perfecting you. He's putting you through a trial and a test that's going to make you come out stronger on the other side. Why do we test a junior in high school before we, we send them up? It's so that we can promote them to the next level. God is putting you through so that he can promote and mature your faith to take you to that next level. The next thing is this, that there's always a way out. Listen again to Paul in 1 Corinthians around our theme verse, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And then listen to this. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. A way out. I like to, to say this phrase like this right here. Every temptation is an invitation to trust in Christ. Isn't that great? Let's say that together as a church right now. Every temptation is an invitation to trust Christ. He gives you a way out. It's time when you're facing that temptation to, to trust in him. And you say, what will be my way out? I don't know what that looks like for you, but I know in my life that I see ways out all the time when a temptation comes and it might be in a, in a subtle way maybe you've experienced this too I, sometimes i'm talking to people in a conversation and i'm i may be getting riled up and i want to say something that that may not be the greatest thing to say and i'm like, uh, about to and then this person will like keep talking or they'll say or interrupt or or somebody will walk in and do the conversation uh, and i'm like like later i'll look back and go whoo Man, that was close. God, I could have almost said something that might have been cutting or hurtful or angry, but you stopped it. Thank you. And so as you open your spiritual eyes and you begin to look around, God is pro constantly providing you a way out. It could be that you, he's saying, just get up and leave the situation. Maybe for you it's more complex and you're tangled up in something that you need to go and talk to a counselor with, about. And he, 
they, if she can help you get untangled. Maybe it's, you need a, an accountability partner that you can call when you're facing a situation. I know in my ministry and career that there's been times when I've had to pick up the phone and call a pastor maybe in another town and just say, hey, would you pray for me right now? I need spiritual support now. And, and maybe you need to do that, that, that God will provide you a way out. When I was growing up in the 80s, we played video games. And they, these weren't like the, the ones that now the 3D and the virtual reality. This was like the 2D. Did anybody play Asteroids, the Atari growing up, man? It was like, uh. And like, so what you were, the spaceship in the middle, the little triangle. And like you put the thrust, like you fly around. Doo, doo, doo. You're like shooting stuff. But you could get flying pretty fast sometimes and like circling through there and asteroids would be coming and there was this special button man when you were about to get creamed by two asteroids this button over here called hyperspace you go boop, and like all of a sudden your guy would just disappear and reappear on the screen somewhere else like just boop, hyperspace you out of there in our lives we don't have a, a hyperspace button but we have hyper grace we can say god i need a way out and he will provide a way out and he'll help you be removed from the situation and get out of there hyper grace because every temptation is an invitation to trust in christ next how can we fight how can we fight temptation because here's the truth today church that we're in a we're on a battleground over here we're not on a, a playground you see the devil wants us to think we're just in a in a playground over here but Satan, the enemy, wants to, to cause us to get tripped up, to divide and put a wedge between the creator and his creation, us, his beautiful children. And he wants to, Satan wants to hurt the heart of God by dividing us. So we need a strategy. We can find that strategy in the word of God in James chapter 4. It says this, submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, I used to think the first step was just resist the devil, but you can't skip over this first part, submit to God. Submit to God, and why would I need that? It's because on my own, I'm not going to last very long in my own strength. I need supernatural help. I need to submit to God. I need to first of all acknowledge that, that what I face is powerful, and it's sinful, and that, that, that the stakes are, are higher than I even realize right now if I were to fall into this thing. But, you know, a lot of times we, we justify it, don't we? We justify getting into something like, hey, man, I've worked hard. I, I deserve this. Man, it's not going to hurt anybody else but, but me. Like, nobody else is involved. Like, and we come up with these, and the enemy speaks these justifications into our, our mind to, to, to say, go ahead and do it. And so I need to submit my mind and say, Holy Spirit, I need your help. Why? Because we're at a war here. And the Bible teaches us in the book of Galatians that there's a battle between our flesh and the spirit in our flesh is the old adam that lives within us and and even in our baptism we've been baptized and so we're a new creation in christ but but that old adam is still in there and martin luther used to teach that in our baptism the old adam was drowned but he is a good swimmer and he comes back day after day and so we daily need to go back to our baptism and drown him because there's a battle going on in our inward nature i want you to think about for a second if i were to just drag a pig out here man he's all caked with mud and he stinks really badly and he's got flies everywhere You're like man what is this it's a pig well i'll say i go steve hawkins come get this pig take him outside hose him down go clean this pig up real good soap him up put some cologne on him put a bow tie on this guy and bring him back out here and then we say what do we have here bass player <laughs> no we have still the same pig okay he still if there was a pile of mud or a pit he would want to jump into it and wall around he he looks different but on the inside his his nature is still to be a pig and so we battle and we have to submit and the apostle paul says i i go to battle to to beat into submission the old man and so i say to god help me as i surrender and submit to you renew my mind every day as i come to you lord and the second thing is that we need to to then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Up in South Dakota, there was a farmer up there, a guy that he was raising sheep and lambs, and he was having a real problem with these coyotes that were coming around all the time, like 
decimating his flock. He tried everything, man. He put up some electric fences, fences. He put out like the smelling stuff to keep them away, and nothing was working. And one day he went to a feed store. He's talking to one of his buddies, another farmer, and the guy goes, you need a llama. He's like, what? He goes, no, man, llamas, they have like this instinctive, protective thing to, uh, for herds, and they, they are like ruthless. They're, they're, they're like fearless. They will go after it. And he's like, what? So he gets one. He puts it out in his flock, and he's watching one night, and the coyotes begin to circle around. And this llama, man, they are so fearless. Like, he goes like this. And he goes over here, huh? And he's like walking over, like looking around. And the coyotes are like, what? Because the first defense that this llama has is he just looks weird, okay? And the coyotes are like, huh? And so then he has this bark. He goes, eh, ah, ah, like some weird thing. And the coyotes are like, and they scatter. But then if they do come, he can spit on like, Pff. and then the last thing, it says that he, this llama, they are so cool. They you can YouTube these up and watch them. They will turn like this and try to roll an animal over, like, sh like kick it on its back, and then turn with its front hooves and like, Bleh, and just try to disembowel this thing. They are fearless. And so, like, this uh, farmer was like, wow, like, this, these coyotes, like, they go away. This, they, the llama resists them, and they flee. How do we resist temptation and, and cause the devil to flee from us? One of the first things we can do is to eliminate temptation whenever we can and to stay away from it. Just eliminate it beforehand. That's a strategy. Listen to what Solomon, King Solomon, was teaching his, his son in Proverbs chapter 4. He says this to him, do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Like, don't even put your toe over there and start to go down it. And then he says this four things. He says, avoid it, do not travel on it, turn from it and go your way. He has four different things. Just so in case you, you don't get all of them or whatever, avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. Go your own way. And so if it was a modern dad talking to his son, he might say, Vamino, son, it's time to bug out. It's time to get out of Dodge. It's time. Run, Forrest, run. If you don't want to get stung by the bees, stay away from the beehive. I heard an old preacher one time, he said this, when you flee temptation, don't send a forwarding address. Isn't that great? Flee temptation. Why would I need to resist a temptation in the future that I can eliminate from my life today? You see, whatever you, whatever you feed thrives, but whatever you starve dies. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, the enemy has an age-old tactic he comes at us with this, this one-two punch idea. The first thing is the devil comes with the right, the jab. He goes, pow, try it, do it. Come on, man, it's no big deal. Boom, and he's tempting us, and then we fall into sin, and then he comes with that left hook. Boom, condemnation. How could you? Boom, you call yourself a child of God. Boom, you go to worship in church, and boom, you'll never rise again. How could you? In the Old Testament, we see the pattern of the children of Israel, God's chosen children on this circle of obedience and disobedience. They start off doing the right thing and obeying God and in his plan, and pretty soon they begin to wander away and come up with their own ideas and idols, and then they, God would send a prophet and say, you need to get back to, to, to my will again, and they would, they, ah, they would repent, and they would come back, and it was just this cycle over and over. And the enemy often would just gloat over him. And I want you to hear what the prophet Micah said to the enemy. And he spoke it for Israel, but he speaks it today for us when he says this in Micah 7, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I am a, a child of God. Don't gloat over me, not, not today, not ever. I am loved with an everlasting love. And, and every morning when you wake up, there's a question that is asked by the enemy and by God. And that question is, who do you think you are? The devil says, who do you think you are? But God says, who do you think you are? You're my child. I went to the cross to lay down my life because I love you so much. And even though you have fallen, yet shall you rise. Even though you have fallen, you are connected to a resurrection story. And so today, it's time. He's calling you to embrace 
your advocate. Embrace your advocate. Jesus is not sitting at the right hand of the Father today with arms crossed saying, oh, there he goes again, or there she goes again. I knew it. He's saying, no, I'm interceding for you, and I'm filling you with power, and I'm filling you with hope to rise up. See, Jesus, he was fallen himself. The devil, he thought he had won. Jesus, on the cross, laid in the tomb for three days. And oh, my friend, on that third day, the ground began to shake and the, the stone rolled back and Jesus came out and he said, though I was fallen, I have risen. And now I give you that same power. And he helps us in our time of, of temptation. And he blocks those punches of the devil and he counter strikes that condemnation with a proclamation. And he says, it's not by your might or your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And so, church, as we head into a new year, as we head into 2019, it's time that we rise up with defiant faith. This says, even though it looks hopeless, I will trust. Even though I might die, yet shall I live. And even though I have fallen into temptation, I will rise forgiven, declared new. I will no longer be labeled by the old, but now I have risen. Because even though I have fallen, I will rise. Say that with me right now. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ. By his power and by his stripes we are healed. Though we have fallen, yet I will rise. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you bring victory and hope to us today. That we've been tangled up. And we've been shackled to things of this world. But God, today you are bringing freedom all across this room. Heavenly Father, for the first time, you are stirring in hearts today. Creating and igniting faith in someone. And so draw them to yourself, Lord. Draw them to receive your love and your grace and your strength and your power. To go from this place to live with their heads held high. Thank you, God. That though we have fallen, we will rise and be with you for all of eternity, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.